17. So Mark chapter 12, uh, verses 13 through 17. Later, they, they, that's the Sanhedrin, sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. They came to him and said, Teacher, we know that you are a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? But Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me, he asked. Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. They brought the coin and he asked them, Whose image is this? And whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said to them, Give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. And they were amazed at him. The Sanhedrin, as we said, were not done investigating Jesus. They sent another group to further test him. We talked about there are a number of controversies now in Jerusalem. There's five of them that match the five in, in Galilee where, where uh, Jesus is challenged by the leadership. And so now it's Pharisees and Herodians, not Pharisees and Sadducees. Pharisees and Sadducees had differences theologically. Pharisees and Herodians had differences politically though one was a religious group. So the Pharisees were kind of like the conservatives of the day. They were the right-wingers of the day. They wanted David's kingdom to be reestablished. They wanted God to reign. Despite all their issues, the Pharisees really wanted the kingdom of Israel to be restored and the yoke of Rome to be thrown off them. Whereas the Herodians, they were kind of the liberals of the day. They wanted the big government. They wanted the King Herod or his family to be reinstated into leadership because they liked what Rome gave them. They liked all the bells and whistles of the, 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 the kind of the Roman government if you had the money to, to participate in that. So the Pharisees, they hated Jesus because he was messing with their religious agenda. But the Herodians, they opposed him because he was threatening their political advantage. He was claiming to be something other than a teacher. So uh, the question here is, for the Pharisees and for the Herodians, is, it, is Jesus going to hold up political goals over eternal goals, spiritual goals? How is he going to balance eternal goals, spiritual goals, and political goals? That's the challenge they're bringing to him. Uh, amazingly, nobody could have brought Pharisees and Herodians together in this day except for Jesus. And he brought them together because they both had a common uh, plan to destroy him. And so Jesus knew they were up to something. They came to trap him. The word there, trap, means to capture. It's usually used when you hunt or fish something in the ancient world. So if I was hunting or fishing, I would trap my animal. Even if I was going to kill it, let's say with a bow, uh, I would trap it. It means to, to pursue something that's a prey. So they saw Jesus as a prey to be captured, to be tri tripped up. And so uh, they hoped to trap him really in a slip of the tongue. They wanted him to say something stupid, kind of a public gaffe that would trap him or, as the NIV says, catch him in his words. Uh, that word trap or catch him in his words is the same word used back in chapter 1 when Satan tempted Jesus. Right. So Luke's gospel says this. This is Luke 20.20. 20. It says, they, as the leadership, watched closely and sent spies who pretended to be righteous so they could catch him in what he said to hand him over to the governor's rule and authority. And so here they are, they're, the religious leaders, the political leaders coming to trap Jesus. His popularity is beginning to fire away theirs, and that's a danger to them. They're tricking him. Don't discount that people are in churches today that are pretending to be righteous. It could be me. You don't even know. You'll know by their fruit and their ultimate, their ultimate goal. And so what Jesus does here, the way he defends himself, is really brilliant. So the question today is, what principles did Jesus use in this confrontation with them that really protected him? What did he, what did he understand in his brain that protected him against his accusers. So we're going to kind of go through some of these principles today that hopefully we can see in the passage and also help us 
when we come against uh, some challenges in our lives, especially in our day, where we're asking some of the same questions. How does our Christianity, our eternal perspective, mesh with the political agendas that are all around us today? The first thing I would say is a principle that Jesus understood is that he understood to put on the armor of your true lineage. To put on the armor of your true lineage. Let me explain what that is, but let me read the scripture again first. Later, they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. They came to him and said, look what they do. Teacher, we know that you're a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. But you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Watch out when people flatter you. You know that, right? When people come to you and say, we know what a great guy you are. We know what a great pastor you are. We know what a great worker you are. Watch out for flattery. Let me just give you just two perspectives from the scriptures from Proverbs regarding flattery. Uh, this is from Proverbs 26, 28. A lying tongue hates those it crushes, and a flattering mouth causes ruin. Watch out for flattery. Proverbs 29. A man who flatters his neighbor spreads a net for his own feet. When they do it, they're not doing it for you. They're doing it for them. So what we see on display here is the Pharisees, the Herodians, attempting to trap Jesus. They call him teacher, which is a title of great respect in that day. It's not like today, the teachers, whatever. In that day, to call someone a teacher was a title of great respect, uh, even though they had no respect for him. Uh, they um, call him the, a, a truthful teacher, even though later on they will accuse him of not being truthful and say he's a blasphemer. They, uh, they say that he's impartial, and they conclude that he teaches the way of God, though they really don't believe that. Otherwise, they wouldn't be trying to trap him in his words. Don't confuse compliments for flattery. There's a difference between flattery and compliments. Uh, the spirit behind a compliment is to build a person up, right? And we can kind of sense that, but the spirit behind flattery is to set a person up. And what they're doing here is not complimenting Jesus on how good a teacher he is. They're trying to set him up. They're trying to get him in a place where he goes, well, thank you very much, and get his own pride up so he can respond out of pride or get, rather than out of truth. And so even though their flattery is insincere, it's still true. Everything they say about Jesus is true. And since it is true, since that really is who Jesus is, He's not going to be snared by their words. Uh, he's not going to inflate with pride because he already knows who he is. He has no place to have false pride in. He, he's not going to lower his God to acquiesce to someone else's opinion of him. Jesus is not fooled by the trap of men. So here's the principle. When we know who we are in God's eyes, it can become a protection against the snares of men. If we're certain of our true lineage, that we're children of the king, flattery will not inflate our, our pride. And if we're demeaned, it's not going to crush our spirits because we know who we are. We know our true lineage. Jesus knew exactly who he was. He had a balance of, of who he was, and he spoke from that knowledge. Uh, when we're flattered... A lot of times we respond to it and we get ensnared because we either have a poor self-image and we want to build ourselves up so we'll follow that flattery or we have a very strong self-image and we, we kind of eat that stuff up and it feeds that. And we need to know who we are in Christ and see who we are. We're a child of God, been redeemed, that we're not higher than others, that we, we are simply a, a sojourner that has found a place where there is life and there's water. And so this is where Jesus is coming from. He knows exactly who he is. This is the principle he's leaning on. And because he knows who he is, these leaders have no chance, absolutely zero chance of ensnaring him because the flattery isn't going to do anything for Jesus. It's not going to lead him down a path that will cause him to uh, fall. Don't ever forget who you are in Christ. As soon as you think you're somebody else, as soon as you look at yourself higher than you should, as soon as you look at yourself lower than you should, you've forgotten who you are. Remember who you are in Christ and you will not fall to the snares of men. The second thing, which is really important in this passage, if we don't get this, then we don't understand the passage at all. The image you bear indicates 
who you belong to. This is a principle in Scripture. The image you bear indicates who you belong to. And so the Scripture goes on. Here's the question. Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? And Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me, he asked. Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. They brought the coin and he asked them, whose image is this? And whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Now, the trap is sprung. The question has been carefully crafted. It's both sides. Should we pay Caesar? That's what a Herodian would do. Or should we not pay Caesar? That's what a Pharisee would do. Whose side are you going to be on? Trying to pilt sides, trying to catch him in a, in a, in a you know, this, the uh, problem. It's a brilliant question. It's a simple question. Is it lawful to pay taxes or not? Should we do what the government says or not? How should we relate as people of God to the government? Stakes are high. Um, the issue at hand, it's, it's volatile. Remember, there are zealots around killing Roman soldiers over this very issue. So it's not just a little simple question. This is a very volatile issue. And it requires a yes or no answer. Jesus can't say, hang on a second, let me expound on this a little bit. Yes or no, Jesus. Do we or don't we? And so they have him, they think. Regardless of which way he goes, pay it or not pay it, they have him um, in, in, a, in a place of where he can't go say the right thing. So the context of the question here bears this out. The Greek word for taxes is kensin. We get the word census from it. It really means imperial tax. The NIV translates it imperial tax. It's not just a general government tax. It's a tax that would go to Rome, that would go to Caesar, it would go to this guy who is out for killing Jews and, and killing churches and squashing the Jewish nation. Uh, the Jews despised it because it was a constant reminder that they were no longer a nation. They were subject to pagan Rome. They were the people of God subject to pagan Rome. So if Jesus said, pay it, the people would turn on him as a traitor. You're a traitor, Jesus. You're a traitor against your people. Rome has subjugated your people. How could you pay that tax? Uh, and he, he would be done. He would be finished. That would be the end of his ministry. On the other hand, if he said not to pay it, then the Herodians would go back to the Romans and they'd say, this guy is not going to pay his taxes. Uh, you can arrest him for sedition and insurrection. And Jesus, in that question, it wasn't an honest question. It had evil intent. And he understood it. So he begins by exposing the hypocrisy, something that they have showed themselves to be over and over and over again, hypocrites, with a question. First thing he says, let me answer the question, why are you testing me? He, he's cutting right to the high. He says, I'm, I'm, basically, I'm not going to answer your question until you understand. I know where you're coming from. You, you haven't pulled a, a fast one on me. Again, this is the same word used in Mark chapter 1 where Satan tests Jesus, tempts Jesus. There's something demonic about their motivation to destroy Jesus. Their, 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 their drive is not one of seeking God, but of trying to, uh, as actually of the enemy of God. And so Jesus asks for a denarius. Um, it's a typical tax required for a day's wage in, in Israel. And ironically, Jesus doesn't even have that. Right? He doesn't, not, doesn't even carry cash with him, right? Um, he trusts Judas. That's a whole different sermon, why he would trust Judas. But, um, but they do. They, they have the denarius, and they bring it to him, and he asks, whose image and inscription is on this? And they said to him, it's Caesar's. Um, and so this is a typical coin. Uh, next screen here. Um, this is maybe the one he's talking about. Um, on the front side is a picture of Tiberius Caesar, who was the, the emperor of that day. Um, it would say, Tiberius Kaiser Augustus. Um, son, uh, on the other side, son of the divine Augustus. He's a little god, right? Caesar, the god who came from Augustus. On the other side, um, he has a picture of his mom. It's his mom, uh, Livia. And the words of Pon is, is Pontifex Massimus, which means uh, high priest. And so this coin, if Jesus grabs that coin, this coin represents all that's wrong. Right? It says that the, the Jews are looking at this coin and they find it idolatrous. It's a man claiming to be God. And on the other side, a woman claiming to be a high priest. It just was the most pagan symbol 
you could ask for. And so Jesus mm -hmm. takes that coin and then he begins to uh, expound on their question. The key to understanding this passage is to understand the, the theological concept of the image. What is Jesus saying about the image? Because the coin had Caesar's image on it, it belonged to Caesar. The image defines who it belongs to. It had Caesar's image on it, it belongs to Caesar. The image we bear as human beings, especially as Christians, as the people of God, sealed by the Holy Spirit, the image we bear is God's image. And because we bear God's image, we belong to God. The image we bear signifies who we belong to and where our ultimate loyalty lies. So Jesus is beginning to set up the foundation of true loyalty, true responsibility and ownership, and he answers their question, but he leaves the application up to them. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. His image is on it. It belongs to Caesar. Your image is that of God. Give to God what is God. So that brings to the third principle. There are two responsibilities. We have our responsibility and we have a greater responsibility. Then Jesus said to them, verse 17, Give back to Caesar what is Caesar and to God what is God's. And they were amazed at him. So two responsibilities. Number one, we have responsibility to give back to Caesar what is Caesar. As a Christian, we have that responsibility. Jesus acknowledges the legitimacy of human governments. Jesus created family, he created the church, and he created human governments. Those are all things created by God. God is not an anarchist. He is not one that wants just things just to gonna just go crazy. Uh, God is, is not a person who uh, is a, a, not a God of order. And so the government has right to levy taxes, and we have a responsibility to pay. It has the right to make laws, and we as Christians have the responsibility to obey. Other writers in the New Testament, Peter and Paul, expounded on this, and they reaffirmed the statement of Jesus. Even though Peter and Paul lived during a time when the emperor was Nero. Nero was a lunatic. All right? He was the pagan of pagans. And when Nero, persecuting Christians, left and right, this is what Peter writes. This is from 1 Peter 2. Submit to every human authority because of the Lord, whether the emperor as a supreme authority or to governors as those sent out by him to punish those who do what is evil and to praise those who do what, those who do what is good. For it is God's will that you silence the ignorance of foolish people by doing good. As God's slaves, live as free people. But don't use your freedom as a way to conceal evil. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Honor the emperor. So, Christians, we have a responsibility to our government. As long as those responsibilities, those obligations, don't interfere with our ability to honor and worship God. If they don't interfere with our ability to honor and worship God, we are to fulfill them. Right? So, if suddenly we would say, we cannot meet anymore because churches are just dangerous, do we obey? Absolutely not. That's not Caesar's realm. That's God's realm. So we are to obey the government as long as we can until it asks us to break biblical principles or biblical commands. We have a responsibility to obey. We can't go down the road and go, I think driving 55 on this road is unrighteous, right? And so I'll, I'm going to, because I just, Jesus told me I could drive 60. No, Jesus did not tell you you could drive 60 because he <laughs> established the government to make laws. And driving 55 as opposed to 60 does not stop your worship in any way. Even if you have on K-Love and it's a fast song, which they're not. <laughs> but anyway, you, you, right? you obey the government. So we have a responsibility to give to Caesar back what is Caesar's. It belongs to him, we give it to him. No matter how much it might make the hairs on the back of my neck stand up sometime when I look at my tax bill and go, this is so bad. But I, it's my responsibility to, be, to obey because God has established those, uh, those governments over us. 
So we have a responsibility to give back to Caesar what is Caesar. But we have a greater responsibility to give to God what is God's. We have a greater responsibility to give back to God what is God's. Why? If the coin has Caesar's image on it, then it belongs to him. So we give him what is rightfully his. But as human beings, every single one of us here bears the image of God. And if we bear the image of God, what is rightfully his is our entire life. Whether you're a Christian or not, it doesn't matter. You bear the image of God, and that's what gives you worth, no matter what you do, what your station in life is. You have ultimate worth because you're created in the image of God. You, God owns you. He created you. See, the problem here is the leaders of the day didn't see that. They're trying to figure out, how do I balance this stuff? What God wants is everything that's God's, and that includes our whole life. See, we obey the government because God tells us to. If God has our whole life, then we, we can make that, that transition very easy. So we have a duty to the government, but we have a, even a greater duty to God who created us and has redeemed us. The coin has Caesar's image, but we have God's image. We have a duty to government, but the greater duty is to God who has created us. In Acts chapter 4, there's some controversy. What is this balance? How does this happen? How, how do we balance uh, politics and our religion and what, when we obey, when we disobey? In Acts 4, uh, Peter and John say this to uh, a government that has been hostile to them. Whether it is right in the sight of God for us to listen to you rather than to God, you decide. Uh, for we are unable to stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. The mission that we have as Christians takes priority. If the government says, be silent, we do not. Because we have uh, a command from God to not be silent. Again, in Acts chapter 5, verse 29, uh, Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. Again, the balance there is, uh, what Caesar's trying to do is jump into the realm of what God owns. And no, that's not the way it works. So with one simple saying here, Jesus has brought everything into proper perspective. He put Caesar in his place, and he has placed God where he rightfully belongs in our lives as well. And all the people could do was stand back in amazement. Well, that, they probably thinking, well, that was simpler than I thought it was going to be. Right? It's simply putting God where he's supposed to be, and everything else falls into place. So here's conclusion. Here's some practical stuff you can take away. Um, and I'll, I'll be honest with you. Um, some of the stuff, this like, makes my hair stand up because... I'll be, I don't want to obey the government sometimes. I just think some of the things they ask us to do is just so dumb, all right? It just doesn't make any sense. But there's nothing in the Scripture that says if the government doesn't make sense, you, you don't have to obey. That's not what it says. <laughs> you obey. So emphatically, yes, as a follower of Jesus, I will obey the government and I will pay taxes because it is the right thing to do. It is the right thing to do to pay your taxes. Uh, but I will always say no to disobeying the word of God and worshiping a man or an institution. And for each one of us, we've got to figure out what that is. Because it's not that easy, right? Because, you know, for example, our tax dollars go to abortions. At least in the past they have. I don't know. And, you know, how, how do, you, do you pay the tax? Do you hold it back? Because, you know, obviously killing innocents isn't a thing God approves. How, how do you balance that? I don't know, all right? This is where, we, you know, we've got some, some gray area here. Um, but I think if we first give ourselves to God, then God leads us in how we should respond to that. So we don't disobey the God. We don't find reasons to be disobedient. We should be the opposite, finding reasons to be obedient. Because we, as Peter says, we honor God by doing what is good. Right? And people see the good rather than the evil in us. I will acknowledge that the government serves in some measure the purposes of promoting good and uh, punishing evil from Romans 13 and also the Peter passage we read. But I will not fully rely on government to bring true righteousness and true justice to the world. That's reserved for God alone. I I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, yeah, they, this police, they quell the, the evil in the world. That's their job. Governments... Um, as a matter of fact, the Romans caption talks about welding the, wielding the sword. God has the, given the government's right for capital punishment to deter evil. 
Um, governments have the right to do that, given to them by God. But don't be deceived. There will never be true justice. There will never be true righteousness until the Lord comes again. That's His realm. So we acknowledge that government has its place, but it does not take the ultimate responsibility away from God. So we need to strive to be good citizens, even if we live in a pagan society, just like the early church did. But if Caesar asks for what belongs to God and not to Caesar, we cannot give it. We do not give it. See, it's for this reason that early Christians died for refusing to offer incense to a statue of Caesar as God. They were dragged away by Nero himself, who they were just told to obey. Dragged away by Nero himself um, and kill, killed in his garden or thrown to the animals. Um, Christians today, in the same way around the world, suffer because they don't bow before pictures of emperors and dictators and presidents. Um, we cannot worship a person or a political party or a state, but only God himself. Our reliance is not on a person, a political party, or state, but only in God himself. Our trust is not ultimately in any person, a political party, or the state. It's only in God himself. Ultimately, we serve God as our greater responsibility. My main allegiance will be to God alone, because I bear his image, and I render to God what is his my whole life but whatever Caesar's you give it to Caesar because here's the thing Caesar's realm will pass away and it won't matter in the least but those who bear the image of God will live forever the question is where do you live forever if you give your whole life to the Lord if you trust in him you're his son. You're his daughter. And perspectives will be given their right place. And we will know how to render to Caesar what is Caesar's and how to give God what is God. Let's pray. Father, this is a very difficult topic in our day. Um, I'm sure it was difficult when this was, when this was written, too. It's the politics and religion and everyday life. Um, Injustice and oppression are, are things that have been around since uh, the fall. Um, and God, it's no different today. Um, we as Christians, we divide among uh, political parties, and, and they really don't matter. Um, that's the realm of Caesar. And God, we, we, many of us put so much effort into that stuff. Um, and, and we need to. We need to be salt and light in those areas, God. But it, it, it shouldn't take as much time as what we give to you. Uh, the area of our spiritual lives and the mission and the call you've placed upon our lives, the, 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 the call to love our family and our neighbors, the call to preach the gospel, uh, the call to live a life that is worthy of the calling that we have received. All the things, God, you tell us are the most important things in life. And so, God, help us to flow uh, our, our actions from who we really are. <clears throat> That who you call us matters. Our, our, our lineage through you matters, God. Uh, when we understand who we are, then some of the things that seem important don't seem so important anymore. And the things that maybe we've put on the back shelf suddenly rise to, to new heights of importance. Father, help us to have eternity in our hearts that we might see what you see and see the world the way you see it. May we live for you and you alone as your image bearers. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.